So it is now nearly eight o'clock, and for Did those we of say you, seven p.m. GMT. For those of you that actually tried to watch it Facebook Live, we think the problem is actually with Teradex server um, because it's going online absolutely fine, and unfortunately, even though the system is going online, it is just not working at all. Um, which is a bit frustrating, to put it mildly. We tried it using the uh, 4G as well with the app. We did. We and, tried Wi-Fi. We tried 4G. And that, that, that just crashed the app. And I've never had that happen before. I've used the Video Pro several times. I've never had that happen at all. So I can only assume there must be an it's error problem. with their, their the server because we had the internet connection, which is a bit frustrating because we really did want to actually prove Go that on. it could be done. So Do you know what? We'll just have to do it next time. Yeah, we'll do it next time. In the meantime, this is his frustrated face. Yeah, it's a little bit annoying. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly go through the show now. Um, and Trevor over there is going to do some wonderful mastery in terms of editing. And he will put all the VTs in. And so we're just going to introduce uh, what we've done. And then we'll create this into a show that we will post up onto YouTube. And then you can watch it not so live. Um, that, but incidentally is actually what you're watching. This is the pre-record you're now watching that's not live, just yes, in case we are now on the pre-record. Confusing, isn't it? Yes. Okay, We're in the so over the last um, few weeks, uh, we've done a few videos. We've been out and about. So first of all, we disappeared off to Dorset, didn't we? We did. We, uh, we took a little trip down to Dorset with the goal of photographing sunset and then sunrise the following morning. Unfortunately, the weather doesn't always play ball when you go to shoot landscapes. And we turned up and, well, frankly, it really wasn't the best weather, was it? It was awful. Um, not to be deterred, though, and this is probably the biggest learning experience you should get from this. Don't be deterred. We went out anyway. Uh, we went out in the, in the gloaming, I think I'm going to call it. It was very low light in the evening for uh, what should have been sunset, but was actually just mm. gradually darkening light. Uh, and we tried to get some pictures of Dirtle Door. Um, and we have a little bit of video to, to show you. It's, uh, it's a few minutes long. Uh, there will be some tips in it. There will be a bit of discussion about not giving up. Um, there will even, excitingly for me, be me beating Guy at pool with one hand and a cast. Yeah, I'll never hear the last of it. Fortunately, what there isn't is him beating me the following morning. But I've at least got that in, so he's feeling slightly less aggrieved now. Should we have a look? I think we should have a look. I think uh, I'm going to take those immortal lines and say, Trev... Roll VT. Uh, what a surprise. He's eating again. Nearly every time. Oh. Every time. Hello. Sorry. Excuse me. Mouthful. Mm -hmm. Welcome. You? Welcome to. Welcome to. Not so sunny Dorset. Um, we've come down to down to the south coast of England. Um, our plan is to head off to Dudley, and we were hoping because we've had some spectacular weather over the last 10 days, to get a really stunning sunset tonight and sunrise tomorrow morning. Sadly, the weather's not playing ball. Uh, it's grey, it's dank, it's dark. But that's landscape photography, that's life, right? We've come here, it's not great, that doesn't mean we're gonna sit here and eat toast, we, we will do that. Um, but we're also going to still head out and see what we can find. So I'm gonna finish my toast. Guy's gonna put the camera away, we're gonna hop in the car, and we're gonna drive down to Erlador. And we're going to try and see what we can get and prove that even when the weather is really quite shockingly bad, you can still get something out. It's still worth going out and experiencing the location you've, you've paid money for or taken time to get to. We figured out what to do. It's raining, so we're going to play pool. That's, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Now, our Dave. Yes. Time to get the rubber glove out. It is <coughs> rubber glove time. Where are we? So we're at the car park at Dirtle Door. And um, the reason we're here is we were hoping to photograph sunset. No. 
So we're going to go and have a look down at the down at Dirtle Law. We're going to have a look at the beach. We maybe do some long exposure in this almost non-existent light, and we might even get some lights out and see if we can get down to Dirtle Law and perhaps try and fire some flash guns around it. Maybe do a bit of light painting. Um, the weather's not great. It is still raining. It's got a little bit lighter than it was earlier on um, when we took our little hiatus for me to beat Guy at pool, um, but it is still raining. Um, so I've got an umbrella with us. Um, got waterproofs on guy's got his wellies on he looks like just william with his little short shorts and his and his wellies and uh yeah we're gonna take a wander and see what we can find so we're taking the main track down there's lots of signs up saying please stick to the main track obviously too many people come down here. it's a very popular tourist destination so a lot of people come down here if you start veering off the main track you're going to create more erosion, create new paths and tracks. And, and you might slip on your backside. And you might slip on your backside as well. Um, but, I mean, I don't really care about someone slipping on their backside if they're being stupid. But I do care about people coming around here and causing greater erosion and destroying the environment and habitat uh, for the wild animals that live around here. So, yes, we're on the main track. We're heading our way down to Dirtle Door. And uh, we'll see what it looks like this evening. See what we can find, what we think we might be able to shoot, even though it's grey and... Damn, it's still quite a beautiful location, quite a beautiful part of the country. So we shall crack on and see what we can see. So we're down at the beach now, we found Erdle Door, wasn't that hard, um, and we're just trying to figure out what we're going to do. At the moment there's nothing going on in the sea, it's, despite the grey and the, the, the poor weather, it's, it's like a mill pond, it's flat calm, okay, you can probably hear the waves, but if you look at the sea itself there's nothing. So I'm thinking maybe long exposure, but we'll, we'll set up, we'll find our shot first, we'll find where we want our composition to be. Um, and then we'll see what we can do from there. So, um, I think we've got something here that's going to work. I'll bring this over a little bit, just to shield the camera a bit more um, from the rain that's coming in from behind. And make it harder for Guy to see me, because it's all got really dark under here. I'm using my favourite landscape camera, it's the 5DSR, and my favourite landscape lens, which is 24 tilt shift. And this is just going to allow me to position the horizon where I want it to be without getting any converging verticals. So, as long as I get everything lined up with where I want it to be, I can then drop the front of the lens, give myself more foreground, which is some of the beach, but everything stays correct in its perspective. Um, so let's get a bit of focus on here. So we've got uh, an eight second exposure. I want to get quite a long exposure because if I've got, uh, if it's too short, I'm gonna to see too much in the water where the waves are just crashing on the shore. And I'd rather that went a bit smoother. In a minute, I'm probably gonna put an ND on to give me a bit longer whilst keeping the aperture a bit wider. So at the moment I'm at ISO 100, I've got F18 and 8 seconds. And that's doing quite a nice job. I mean, the sky is very flat, um, but in terms of the, the effect on the water, it's quite nice. I'm considering switching to monochrome as well. Just going to have a little look at it in black and white because it might have a bit more of a, an ethereal feel in black and white. We don't have any strong colour, so I'm going to have a look at it in black and white. It's going to help me concentrate more on the shape and form of what I'm shooting, and I can always have the colour back later because I'm shooting him raw. That tide oh, that's a little bit. There's tide coming in, mate, aren't I think the tide might be coming in. Look at that. Yeah, but I'm wet. I'm, I'm just about okay. I've switched to vertical. 
just because I like vertical. Um, and the whole width of this isn't really working for me. So I figured if I went high instead, I might end up with something a little bit better. And now I'm just trying to juggle an umbrella. And the camera. So it's not looking too bad. I mean, it's, it is flat. We're trying to work with, with no real light, but uh, that's, that's not too bad. It's turned out quite nicely. We've got quite a long exposure. We're on um, 18 seconds and we're at F18. I've got the grad in. I think I might go slightly heavier on the grad just to try and get something into that sky. At the moment, it's just flat white. Um, and while I'm majoring on the foreground, I would still like to have something in the sky. In, in truth, I'd rather have some lovely clouds and, and punchy sky and whatever, but um, that's clearly not going to happen. So I'm, I'm just going to try and darken it down and see if I can balance it off a little bit more with the, the depth and darkness of the foreground. So um, I think it, it might be time for another grad. So, exposure's just finished. A um, bit better, you'll notice I've got three grads on the front now. One of them is reversed. So I've got a three stop soft, a two stop hard, and then reversed up the other way, I've got a one stop hard, just to bring the foreground down a little bit. Now I could change the gradation between the top two, um, but I already had them set and it was easier just to put another grad in just to bring the foreground down to match so that it's a bit more balanced. Um, also allows me to control the light across the horizon line because I can overlay or not the grad lines to make that bit a little bit darker, a bit like a dark stripe. Um, and I think we've got an image that, you know, while fundamentally the weather is terrible and the light is dull, we've got quite a nice uh, moody, maybe a bit somber uh, black and white image of Dirtle Door. Okay, so what have we learned from that? What have we learned from that? Well, I think we've uh, we've learned that indeed, never give up. You've made you've made the effort to to head somewhere. You've gone to the trouble of driving, in our case, down to the south coast. Um, you've booked a hotel, and the weather's not played ball, but you've still gone out and you've created some imagery. And the reality is that you've probably not created something prize winning. Uh, certainly, I did not create anything prize winning. It, it, it's an okay image, um, but with every picture I take, I learn something. So just being out with your camera is a great way to improve, even when you're not getting the amazing shots that you'd originally uh, hoped to get. So uh, yeah, when you make the effort to go somewhere, actually don't be put off by the weather. There are still pictures to be made uh, and there's learning to be done and you should actually go out and shoot. I want to add something as well. And that was this, once again, you love this camera, don't you? Do you know what? I really do love this camera. But you have to give it credit. Whilst you run your umbrella, while it was piddling down with rain, yeah. this I, I could take this road mic off and, and pretty much sort of squeeze this and the water just came off it. I mean, this was absolutely drenched. The whole camera was drenched because I was shooting in the rain. And also shooting in dark. I mean, it was 6400 ISO again. Um, and okay, you can see a little bit of grain on it, but again, it's pretty good. The other thing was More when you were walking... for me, actually. I, I thought, I mean, the, the whole weather ceiling I take for granted, strangely, probably because of the kit that I normally use. But I was really impressed, as I know you were, with the IS while we were walking. Yeah, because I was literally holding it like that. It's a glorified selfie yeah. camera, to be I, honest. I basically was holding it, actually, yeah. I was. I had that like that and I was holding it like that as we were walking down just basically shooting you and I think it's incredible considering that I mean you, know, you start to get to the point and you think you know do we need a gimbal sort of kind of yeah. thing you know it, it, was, it, it was really it was pretty steep it was rocky it yeah was, it, was. it was uneven yeah. terrain and, and and it was remarkably stable actually so um, yeah 
kudos, kudos to the GH5 for its Again. image stabilization. Again? Yeah, no, I still like it. So, last month we had some uh, pictures. We did. And they were done by a wonderful company called Genesis. They were, the wonderful Ken. Yep, and so we disappeared off to sunny downtown Fulham to go and meet Ken and, or rather, go and see him and to find out exactly how you go about getting these prints. Now, one of the things that most photographers don't do is actually print their pictures. I mean, if we, we ask for a show of hands now, if you comment how many people actually print their pictures, uh, and then of those, how many print to A3 or A2. Uh, and actually, one of the things about photography is that, you know, it came from prints. And, and for many people that shot film, certainly I remember the first print that I had come up mm. in the dev. And it, it was an amazing moment. And we seem to have got away from that. We're all about the pixels on the screen these days. Uh, and, and we seem to forget about printing. So going to a really high quality print lab, somewhere that can really make your images shine is definitely worth doing. Uh, and Genesis, I think, did that for, for our pictures. Let's have a look. I think we should. Dave, we're no longer in the States. We're not. It's we're not in downtown Fulham, hot. apparently. We are. Not quite too hot, a uh, little bit more overcast. So what are we doing in downtown Fulham? Well, uh, we're doing what most photographers don't do, which is actually getting some pictures printed. So the pictures that we shot on the road trip, uh, we have a few of them here. And uh, Ken, this is Ken Hi guys. Genesis. Hello. Welcome nice to Genesis. To meet you. Ken, tell us a little bit about what you do. So, Obviously you're a printer. Yeah. But... Oh, okay. So we, we basically specialize in printing, framing, mounting. Um, we work with photographers, artists, galleries, architects. Um, our background is basically photographic. Uh, we started processing film back in the day 20 years ago. Uh, and here we are today, basically printing films uh, on the Lambda C type using Fuji Crystal Archive paper, uh, printing inkjets and, and DTM as well, which is printing direct to any substrate, which is glass, mirror, aluminium, dye bonds for interior and exterior use. Brilliant. Should we go in and have a yeah, look then? Yeah, have a look. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to go in. Go See you later. Let me sort of start then by asking you, so when you came in, Saw the files on the screen and then did a bit of manipulation, cropping and so on. Very little, mind you. What was your first reaction to when you saw these prints coming off the processor? Is this what you expected? Better? I'll be honest, when I turned up here, I didn't really understand the whole process of how it really was like good old fashioned processing. You just thought it was going to be a big ink jet print, didn't you? Yeah, I kind of did actually. Yeah, I just yeah. thought that it was going through some kind of special ink inkjet system. It is a special inkjet. It's called the RA4 process, the traditional process, which we all grew up to yeah. in the photographic industry anyway. Um, so going back to the images, sort of contrast, saturation, sharpness, pleased with everything? Very pleased, very right. pleased indeed. Good, good um, to hear that. So we're doing something right, Steve. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which yes. is great. Yeah. 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 Uh, looking, looking at pictures on the screen, is, you know, there's a bit of a memory there, but this is so much more visceral. Being able to see a large print, it, it really just, you know, it transports me back to... Valley of Fire and, and Mono Lake and, and, you know, the road into June Lake and, and Yosemite over here. Yeah, and I think also the other thing is, is that, you know, it, it's all very well looking at these on a nice backlit screen and everything else, but you don't get the, the warmth and the richness of all the different colours that we saw on the day. Yeah, I mean, um, this is a really accurate representation yeah. because this, this section here is yeah. in sun, so it's got that lovely warmth, you know, yeah. we were there at sunset, the light was going down, you've got the beautiful richness of tones going on here, mm. but this... It's all in shade, mm. so it's a lot softer. Yes, um, you don't have that kind of the really vibrant reds. You've still got it's all obviously the same rock formation. Mm. Yeah. You've still got some of the red in there, but the vibrance is softer. The contrast is yeah. harder. On my one, yeah. this was what I was really interested to right, see. The detail just how that came out in the shadows because that right. was that was the thing that mm. astonished me a about the camera because it was pretty much pitch black. Well, you couldn't see any mm. of this with the naked eye, and it was really more a test of just see what we could pull out. Mm and seeing just how far we could go. It is, it's great. It's and really well. the detail in there is, is quite astonishing. Yeah. But again, you know, it's just, it's just, the colours are beautiful. Right. You know what's really nice about this being a C-type print as well? Well, see, if it's an inkjet, it's all made up of dots, right? It is correct. But yeah. this, we can get right up close, and there's not a dot to be seen. It's just yeah, a smooth continuous color. tone print. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was trying to say, basically. It's lovely and smooth. Yeah, it's the physical form of the C-type print, it's smooth. Especially, I'm assuming, when you're dealing with this kind of graduation, it becomes very, very noticeable otherwise. Sure. And if you were to print that same image on an inkjet, you will find it's a little bit more contrast here. Mm -hmm. So the shadow areas do block up, yeah. um, whereas in a, in a C-type, being that sort of smooth, continuous tone, 
it does pick up a lot more. So that really suits the that GFX and GFX's ability to pull that kind of yeah, detail out of the shadows. So we've got a couple of other prints here. Uh, and this is on Fuji velvet paper. So we were looking at, what was this paper again? Oh, this is Crystal Archive uh, semi-matte. Semi -matte, sem Sorry, yeah, semi-matte. Okay, so this is our semi-matte Crystal yeah. Archive, and now we've got Fuji velvet, which is, yeah. I guess, um, you were saying in an inkjet form, a bit more like a rag. Rag paper, where it's softer, um, not as harsh, uh, very flat, very smooth. Um, so this is, again, goes for the same process as the Crystal Archive does. But it's got the uh, the benefit of the softness and and the um, just less contrasty. I think image. this for this image looks stunning. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the the smoothness through yeah. here is just beautiful, yeah. and the detail as well. It's got sharpness as well. Mm. Yes. Smooth, smooth and sharp. Yeah. Particularly on this image because the water is so smooth because you shot with a long exposure. Yes. But then you've got obviously the non-moving sections. Yeah. The detail through this foreground rock and this little bit here. Beautiful, here. isn't it? It's unbelievable how much yeah, it's been just, retained. It just literally pulls it out, doesn't it? So the beauty of this is it goes through the same process as our uh, C-type paper does. I yeah. mean, it is a C-type paper, paper yeah. but obviously it's got the softness. Just kind of soft. uh, yeah. Just yeah. Very nice. It works really well. Basically. It's just a slightly different emulsion. Oh, it um, works really nicely with that one. Yeah. yeah. Not sure it works so well with your one. No, I think this this possibly would suit the Crystal Archive a bit more, bring yeah. a bit more yeah. punch. But you suit. like you like quite punchy I, shots, don't I you? I like quite punchy, and also this was shot slightly later than your image, so you didn't have sun yet on the mountains. No, I didn't. You had a, so you've got that soft mm. sort of pre sunrise, the, the, the last glow. last little bit of dawn There's light. Glow there. Whereas yeah. I've just I shot this slightly later and you see yeah, that the you sun's can see the up. Detail, okay. You've got a bit of sun here in the toothers. Mm. Uh, and just the tops of the mountains here, and that that suits a bit more punch, a bit more contrast, mm. maybe. I mean, it still looks still looks lovely, but I think I think in terms of a final, if I was sending this to a client, I'd probably ask for this yeah. to be on Crystal Archive. But your your as I say, your images are more contrasted, mm. so it would lend itself probably to be on the gloss or, or the semi matte, whereas this image is totally flat, yes, and hence it, it suits it better. Um, oh, but not forgetting, it's still got the same qualities as the. Um, normal crystal archive mm -hmm. so it is it is archival um but it's it's a different range in which is products no, i can't thank you both enough really, no, really can't. i mean it's just incredible to see them like this it That's really is and you do need to see it to really understand think, yeah. it um as good as it's going to come out on this it's never going to be as good as seeing them in the flesh they are quite stunning Hello, we're all on a whole different camera now. This is this is Rove camera. Uh, Guy, you can see, has a bit of the shakes. I think that's the frustration coming through. What we're going to do now is show you the kit that we have set up around us. Uh, and indeed, the team behind us. So, uh, Katie, Trev, please wave. There we go. Okay, now, this little portable studio setup that we have here, um, we've got some data video block cameras. There's uh, the one that, that you're being shown now is a 50 mil. It's, it's our wide, uh, it's our wide camera. And interestingly, this one can actually broadcast on its own. So this has got an Ethernet connection, and you you don't need to go through the mixing box or anything like that. Um, the other two cameras that we have, which is the camera for me and the camera for Guy, um, these are our close-up cameras, and these are data video uh, block cameras, but they're zooms. So you've got the ability to zoom in and out and, and obviously adjust your framing. It works really nicely in this kind of setup um, and, and creates what is quite a simple three camera setup for two of us to, to chat some stuff. Yeah. I was going to say rubbish. but yeah, No, no, well, we do talk rubbish. And I think we just need to quickly point out we've got some F&V lights here, which are incredibly good value. I mean, they really are good value. They are. Dirt cheap to hire. And if we walk around, as I'm now going to do... Guys, maybe. avoiding... Spaghetti junction yep. tables. Trying to do my best. So we're going to wander around and see Trev. Say hi, Trev. Hi. Didn't say hi, Trev. Just said hi. No, right. Just said hi. It's not okay. Good at so basically, to Trev. Trev is using a data video mobile cast station here. Um, it's six channels. Uh, we've got four SDI in, and then we've got two HDMI in. We are using the SDIs for the block cameras, and also for my roving camera, which is a Canon XA. 25. We've then got the laptop for running the VT, which is then going HDMI straight in there as well. And then all of that is going out to a Shogun, which is sitting down here, which is recording all of this. And then we were to be streaming via Teradec Video Pro. And to be fair, 
usually work absolutely perfectly. There just seems to be some issue with the server, which is just Sod's law when it happens to be when we want to do the video. And then for sound, we're using a Zoom H, uh, sorry, a Zoom F4 um, with both of us having Sony ECM 77 mics um, going into that along with the sound from the laptop. So that's kind of it. So do you want to switch back to his lordship now and I'll go and run back? Hello. God, that's frightening, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely terrifying, I'm sure, for all of you. So uh, Guy is just working his way back through the cable uh, clutter. Um, we didn't really tidy up our cables as well as we probably should have done. He's also just walking in front of my camera as well, but Guy yeah, is, is... don't worry about that. that. Don't worry about that. So, so yeah, I mean, it took me two hours to set this up on my own before you arrived mm -hmm. in your royal carriage. And... Um, I have to say it's been incredibly easy. It's frustrating about the Video Pro and um, the server issues, but you know these things happen. Um, I can tell you next month we'll have at least two solutions available to us. So, sure you know, we yes, so it won't happen again. Um, but in terms of controlling it, I'd just like to say that this is the first time that Trevor's ever used this. Mm -hmm. Never touched it before um, until about an hour and a half ago. And look, he's got four buttons, and he can cut between any one of them. Five, <laughs> but six buttons actually. Six. He's he's got one extra button than the number of fingers on a hand, so he does have to use two. Right, just have to think about that. Oh, actually, no, he's from Peterborough. Uh, yeah. Hold your hand up, Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, we need to uh, get back to the story in hand. So we do. Um, as many of you will know, I like my Fujifilm GFX. What a lot of you probably don't know is, is that a certain gentleman at Fujifilm, um, Theo Georgiadis, who is the general manager of the digital um, imaging group, um, I've known him longer than anybody else in the industry. Funnily enough, he was at a meeting I went to with Fujifilm some 15 years ago when I was trying to get an account to buy some cameras. So I thought it'd be quite a good idea to pop over to Fujifilm uh, Towers and go and find out a little bit more about his journey over the last 15 years, um, his involvement with Fujifilm, a little bit behind the scenes, finding out a few little interesting stories that you may not have heard of. So um, it's quite a long interview, so we've cut it into two bits, and here's the first bit. So Theo. Hi Guy. 15 years, I think, pretty much, uh, ago we first met. Yeah, about that. We were actually a corporate hire company at that point and we were looking at getting a whole load of compacts and we were introduced and we started stocking the um, Fuji compacts and obviously Fuji became enormous on the compact scene in that respect. You know, you kept coming out with models and producing incredible products and it was a massive volume market for you. I'm assuming that, you know, you at that point also had the problem with the film market just literally shooting down. Was that why you sort of pushed very hard with the compacts? You know, Fujifilm is, is very much into its innovation. Um, so whatever type of imaging market we're, we're in, and we're always looking to evolve our products. Um, and as we started to see the, um, the early stages in 1996 or so of, of digital cameras, of digital technology starting to, to come into more of the, uh, the mass uh, market, um, we were right at the forefront. Uh, I joined Fuji myself uh, 1st of September 1999. I know that's my mum's birthday, so I'll never forget <laughs> that. Um, and I remember joining uh, just pretty much out to university, um, and I'd done a degree in, in digital photography because there was a lot of buzz about is digital going to take over film? And that was always the big, big thing. Um, and as we know, it definitely has. Um, it's evolved from um, the compact market. Um, and when we say compact, even that grew bigger and bigger um, to very much lowing compact cameras, plastic, double A, uh, and we had metal, lithium iron. Um, the zooms got longer and longer, and then it evolved to this bridge type product. Everyone was asking, what is a bridge camera? And basically it was a camera that bridged the gap between a compact camera and a DSLR. Because you were... Correct me if I'm wrong, because I remember we were talking about this earlier, because I bought a 603. Yeah. Um, and you, first of all, you were pretty much the first, weren't you, with coming out with a high-end compact camera. I mean, yeah. a really expensive compact camera. Sure. So we, um, well, let me, I'll fast forward a little bit. We, we, were, we had a camera called the Finepix 4700, which was the first super CCD camera. Because 
in the early days, again, we were at the forefront at the beginning. We had the first digital camera with removable memory um, with, um, with a two megabyte memory card, um, which cost probably 200 pounds. Uh, but we had these unique design cameras, which were the upright style ones. Mm. Um, and the design, I think, made everyone sit up and think, oh, they, they look really cool. They, they don't look like traditional film cameras, and we want to go away from that. Um, and Super CCD was, was developed to try and mirror the quality of film, because it had octagonal rather than um, square pixels. Um, and and the, the image quality was phenomenal. And everything we done, um, from film, moving into digital cameras, where we are now with X-Series, the whole thing about it was about having the best image quality and what we can do to give to the consumer the best experience. Um, and as you can see here on the table here, there is a whole history of compact cameras, DSLRs, mirrorless, bridge, the new GFX. And it, it's a phenomenal journey, as you say. Um, so, so if we then sort of fast forward, otherwise we will be here for hours, and then we will be <laughs> you and I. Um, if we fast forward to you know the digital SLR side of things, because interestingly for us, this, we were talking about parallels earlier, this was where we then got in and became a photography hire company when we bought the first batch of S2s, yeah. S2 Pros. What made Fujifilm move into that market? Well, Fujifilm always had very high-end um, field products. So if you remember, we had the media format cameras, the GX645, GX680s, the GX, uh, it was the 617, the panoramic one. So we were always in touch with the professional. Um, and as we developed the, the compact side of things, we felt there was, there was a bit of a disconnect with the old professional because we never had an interchangeable product to, to make an offering. Now, as we know, Canon and Nikon absolutely dominate the DSLR market. And we saw that market continue to evolve and gain pace. So you take a decision. Do you do, do something like what the other brands did, uh, Sony and even Samsung? Do you go it alone and start your system from scratch? Or do you, do you team up with a brand and, and, and work something together? We had a product, uh, one of the earliest interchangeable cameras, was a camera called the Fujix. And that was something that Fujifilm and Nikon developed together. Um, it was a horrendous amount. I, I can't even hazard a guess. It was in the, over 10,000 um, pounds. And that was very early on. Um, that, that slowly passed away. Um, and then when we decided to move into the DSLR market, we did go back to Nikon and, and we had a partnership together. And these cameras here, um, they're a Nikon F mount. As you can mm. see, we got it right there. So we didn't shy away from it. Uh, everyone knew straight away that it was a Nikon camera. They've got fantastic glass, as we know. Um, but it was Fuji Guts. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that we were very, very good on and we're still very, very proud of it is we understand image quality, we understand color, we understand tone, we understand all that as an imaging expert. In the film days, Canon and Nikon, again, dominate from a hardware point of view, but a lot of photographers use Fuji film. Why? Because they love the colors of Velvia and Provia and Astia and all those fantastic films. So we started to develop um, together with Nikon, a camera which Nikon mount, Nikon glass, the Fuji guts. And it was slower than the Nikon's uh, equivalent, uh, but the image quality was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it was a good. great marriage. Uh, and we had done very, very well with landscape photographers. We've done very, very well with portrait and studio and, um, and wedding photographers. And we had, um, we had four cameras, the S1, the S2, the S3, Leap for the S4, we had an S5. Um, and yeah, we've done very, very well. Uh, and we got, it was a chance to reconnect with the professional uh, and the real top end enthusiast because we lost a bit of that by just concentrating on the compact side of things. Um, but it gave us a lot of insight about where to go next uh, and, and what path we should take as a brand. Um, and at the, at the end of it, where the S5 was around, we sit up there and said, look, do we make a system on our own? Do we go DSLR, which we could have done? Or do we look at this new compact system mirrorless type product, which I think Panasonic were, were the first uh, 2008 uh, to bring out uh, this, this new age of, of mirrorless cameras. And at the time, mirrorless wasn't really designed for the professional. The mirrorless camera was designed as a, an alternative to the mid to low end enthusiast. 
But like anything, anything new comes at a price. And obviously DSLRs were very, very competitively priced. And that was a big, big challenge uh, around the world that mirrorless cameras at one point weren't working. Uh, weren't working in the way that a lot of the brands had thought they were going to work, expected to. The 2010 Photokina. Yes. X100 appears. Landmark. What did you think at the time? Because it must have been incredibly, re I mean, we remember what it was like in 2010. So go forward to two years before that. What did well, you think? it was, um, look, I'm very fortunate. I get a chance to go to Japan and, and, and I've got to know the team, the R&D team and the, and the designers, et cetera, et cetera. So when we sat there in the meeting uh, and we said, look, it, this is our compact lineup and we've got something new to show you and we want to hear what you think. There was a bit of a gasp around the room thinking, how do we go away from selling 50, 100, 200 pound, 300 pound compact cameras and to convincing the world that a fixed lens APS-C camera for the enthusiast at that thousand pound mark is gonna work. Did at that point when you had that meeting, were you were aware of then the whole interchangeable X series? No. So you just at that point, you didn't know anything about that. That hadn't even been thought of. It was more just a case of, just the X100. The thought the process, X100. yeah, the thought process was less, this is like a test bed. Let's test the water. Is there an appetite for a high-end pure photographer's camera? And if that worked, then we were going to go to the next phase and to make an interchangeable version of it. Um, and, and the X100 was phenomenal. And I'm not going to sit and say we knew from the beginning it was going to work. Um, we were confident because we know we have very good heritage on for imaging and very good heritage for lenses. Um, but the interest was phenomenal. And we remember 2010, Photokina, when we brought the concept product out, just standing on the stand, listening, watching consumers going, oh my God, this is so cool. And we were on a winner. We knew then, we're like, actually, we've done the right thing. We've never looked back. Um, we knew at the po that point that the compact market was starting to fall off. So if we didn't make a change, yeah, we would have suffered in a yeah. big, big way. Um, compact cameras became a commodity, a very, very tough, aggressive market. Smartphones are coming through. Um, the quality of some of the smartphones now are just phenomenal. Um, and that's where, that's where you start to see a big shift from people taking the pictures on their phone because they wanted to share them. They wanted, to, they wanted that easy access. People were spending a lot, le a lot less on compact cameras. Um, and that's why we needed to step things up. We needed to make a camera that really a smartphone couldn't compete with. So X100 comes out um, in 2010. How long was it before literally straight on the uh, drawing board working out the interchangeable lens concepts and series? It wasn't, it wasn't that long after. Uh, 2010, we announced X100, uh, and then literally a few months later, we started discussions about uh, X-Pro1. Um, and initially, we'd, our absolute want was to make an interchangeable X100. Um, but once the engineers got involved, the R&D designers got involved, obviously we had to, had to evolve and be slightly bigger. I believe we have, yeah, we have the X100, X Pro 1 here. And as you can see, it's not that much bigger. But again, this, this um, was fantastic for us. But it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just the concept and the design um, and the sort of the perceived quality from sort of having the traditional layout. There were two things that were pivotal for me, certainly. One was the hybrid viewfinder, and the other was the sex trans sensor. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, I remember at the time playing with it, and just thought, this is brilliant. Well, that, yeah, because the, the original X100 was a standard Bayer sensor. Yeah, that's right. But what people loved was the compactness, the, the viewfinder, the, the, the lens, and the quality was excellent. Um, it wasn't the finished article, but it was an amazing leap of mm -hmm. what we've done. Um, the X Pro One was the first X Trans product, um, and going and I go back to Super CCD. We wanted something that was going to be film like, uh, because that's that's why I think a lot of people migrate to Fujifilm and love using Fujifilm cameras because the the end result is fantastic. Uh, and I keep on going on. We are imaging experts, um, and the team in Japan are phenomenal. Um, and the, the the time and effort and investment that goes into 
making the sensors, the, the processes, the, the filters around what goes on in the, inside these beautiful cameras um, is absolutely fantastic. And that's where the heart and the guts of it comes from it all. So it's quite interesting that, I mean, you, you at some point must have used a compact camera. Yes. I'm assuming. Yes, I have used my share of compact cameras in my time. And Fujifilm did have some pretty cool ones. I love those Porsche design ones. They're very they did. cool. They did. I mean, they, they've had uh, a good collection of cameras over the years. They've had some really interesting products that have performed really well, given great results. I mean, it's not, not something I've necessarily used extensively, but I, I've dabbled and played. Well, take my word for it. Okay, I will. I'm happy to see that. But you must admit, when the X100 came out at Photokina, which we're talking about in that in 2010, mm -hmm. it was majorly cool. It was majorly cool. It was a big announcement and uh, and signalled a bit of a sea change in the industry, I think. Yeah, and it was the start of, you know, real, a, a genuine turnaround with Fujifilm. So it was really interesting. Well, you can look forward to the next part next month because then we start to talk about the um, X series and the interchangeable side of things. And so, yeah, a bit more interesting. So I think we've kind of covered everything. Um, Again, sorry, this is now a pre-record and it's not live. Sorry, um, you therefore can't ask questions, but feel free to flood the comments with questions um, and we will do our best to answer them uh, over the coming coming days. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We've got a few more ideas and a few more trips planned. We um, do. We have some, some little trips, uh, trips in the pipeline. Yeah, so apologies again that uh, it didn't work out as planned. I think we've now proved what with our Dorset trip and with this that sometimes things just don't work the way you want them to. Um, and hopefully it'll all be better next month. Hopefully it will. I think, uh, I think we'll learn from this. We've obviously, there's been a lot of sport on recently, right? Mm. And there's been a lot of learning experiences for various people. So I think we, we take this as a learning experience. Very much And so. we move forwards and we, we improve next time. And until the next time when he improves, um, we'll say goodbye. Good night. Good night.